Hey everyone, thanks again for joining us. We are in International Dark Sky Weekday number six. Uh, hopefully you were able to join us uh, just about an hour ago for Wendy's presentation where she took us through a virtual star hop using Stellarium uh, to kind of see how to plan your, your star hopping uh, night sky watching adventure. Duke Johnson is with us um, tonight now. He is the Associate Director out at Clark Planetarium. And I feel so honored and thrilled to have Duke joining us. He is going to be telling us how to take our cameras off of the auto settings that we're all so attached to uh, in order to take really brilliant photos of the night sky. So uh, thanks again, Duke, for joining us for this. And uh, I will let you take it away. I will be monitoring the comments section uh, on the Facebook and YouTube stream. So if you have any questions for Duke or I, just pop them in there and we'll address those throughout the presentation. Go ahead, Duke, you're up. Oh, okay. I was just waiting for the, the screen to switch over. I guess it does that uh, when I start talking. Yay, we're figuring out the technology. All right, well, uh, great to be with all of you today. Um, thanks, uh, Trish, for the introduction. I think that uh, we've got an enormous amount of content to kind of just blaze through tonight. And the idea is that we go through and talk about all of these things that you can do. And we know that you've got the gear that you've got. Uh, I'm gonna give you an idea of what you can do if you've got some other gear maybe than you already have. But uh, for the most part, just try to pick up a few things that you'll be able to use to get out and enjoy the night sky because there's so many locations that have a decent dark sky. And a decent dark sky is really a key here because we have uh, a, a sky all around most of the, the, the planet now that is light polluted, right? Especially uh, across the US. And so my other role of course is I am a board member for the International Dark Sky Association. And uh, we want to, use lighting a very we want it to be very effective and very smart so there are ways that the lighting that we can use can be energy efficient and functional and all of those things and uh, in fact cost uh, cities and municipalities a whole lot less money than it currently does so uh, our goal is to make all of you aware that there are things that you can do when things come up to say hey i know there are solutions here and uh, of course by checking out the ida website uh, International Dark Sky Association, there are lots of ways that you can be involved or uh, just help in making the right choices to keep our skies dark. Because a lot of the places that I go to take these images, uh, sometimes I often drive four or five or six hours one way, take, you know, I'll shoot for the night and then I'll come back home. And I'd really like to not drive for, you know, 10 or 11 hours just so I could go and have a nice shoot. Okay, that said, uh, like I said, we've got a lot of fun things to talk about. I'll start off with my first slide. So, and it says I can't share my screen. Okay, uh, we, we, we tried this earlier, it worked fine. Uh, we'll try it one more time. I think it's liking it this time. There, hopefully everybody sees that. Okay, um, so, Always be ready, number one. Uh, this last comment that we had, uh, Neil Wise, uh, this thing was amazing. And uh, you know, thanks to some park photographers for, for taking some rangers for taking pictures. Uh, I got the idea that uh, it would be really cool to stop at Great Fountain Geyser on the way home last summer when I happened to have my camera rig along. Uh, the cool thing here is my tracker broke at the beginning of that trip. I, I always carry it. And I was going to use my tracker to track the stars so that I get nice round stars instead of lines. And it broke early on. So in a couple of days, I had to figure out how I could do a decent shot and basically not do it with a tracker. And it turns out that you can. There's uh, great advances in software and technology now that can allow you to get this. Uh, and this one, I actually had to down sample in the end of it. Uh, and I've, I've got this hanging as a 30 by 50 inch print uh, up, in, up in the uh, entryway to my house. So uh, it, it can be done if you need to, and it can be done pretty quickly if you just kind of look to uh, YouTube or watch any of those videos. 
There we go. So uh, Comet Neo Wise, uh, a few different locations. So that's the Medicine Wheel up in Valley City, uh, North Dakota. That's where I was uh, visiting my mother. This is the High Line Bridge. We heard a, tr a rumble of a train coming. So if you hurry and quickly adjust your settings on your camera when you're out, you can uh, actually capture something that's moving a little bit. You can see that it is a little bit blurry, but you can get all kinds of things in uh, one shot. You just have to go in, and one of the keys is knowing how your gear operates, whether it's a phone, whether it's a camera, whatever it is, you can look at it and uh, tell if the image is doing what you want it to do. And uh, as Trish said, maybe you want to change some of the auto settings. And I, I learned on a manual camera, and I run everything on manual all the way. Uh, I know you don't quite have to anymore, but for a lot of astrophotography stuff, you really probably want to. So what things should you consider when you're gonna get out and get some great pictures, right? Well, get out of town, use the thing you have, whatever it is, cell phone, camera. Good street tripod is important, can't emphasize that enough. Uh, understand your device. On many of my cameras, I have read through those uh, books in the areas that make sense four or five times to understand. You can also look for YouTube reviews and YouTube videos about how to use your device better. There are other apps available that allow shooting in very low light. Uh, and you can uh, actually you know, download those for your device and find that you get lots better results often than what comes pre-installed. Uh, now, there are ways that you can take, and, and you can take whatever number of images you get uh, recommended, though kind of four to eight images seems to be a, a good sweet spot. Uh, of, of, so you, you aim your gear at one scene, take four to eight images, and then you can stack them later. Uh, and the stacking actually works very painlessly, and you can learn to do that in probably under 30 minutes by just watching a video. Uh, use a lens that ha uh, has an opening, okay, has an f-stop of, of 1.4 if you can get them. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show you a bunch of gear here in a little bit, but uh, I know most lenses that come in the kits and other things are about f3.5. And I can tell you, if you're shooting an f3.5, you're going to need to take a bunch of exposures at high ISO and stack them in order to get uh, decent images. But if you can spend a little bit of money and then purchase a, a decent lens, uh, you'll be well on your way to being able to capture images a whole lot better. And you, you saw the histogram on the bottom for a long time. Uh, if your camera will display a histogram, it's really important and you want it to fill at least the third of the screen on the left. And honestly, it's great if it tails off like this into the half range. You want to definitely have it uh, kind of fill a screen like that. That allows you lots of latitude when you go into post-processing to get a very usable, very printable image out of it. A lot of people that I see show me, you know, if we're out shooting and I run into other people, they'll show me stuff that just winds up in the very corner of the, this quadrant. And you know what? It looks okay on the back of your camera screen, but I can tell you, you're going to be really disappointed when you get back to your computer. So you've got to make sure that you've got a histogram that looks like that. For me, that's one of the keys of having a su successful shoot. All right. Um, if you're going to take decent pictures, oh, and I should mention this too. If you've got questions along the way, I think you, you can chat those in and uh, our, our host will kind of break in and let me know what some of those questions are. We are going to try to get to each of these things in turn, but uh, just go ahead, uh, chat in the questions, and we'll, we'll try and answer them. But if, you, if you've got... I'm going to jump in because we already do have a question. <laughs> um, uh, David wants to know, long exposures on iPhone, are they possible? I, I would guess I have Android stuff, and I know that you can download an app for Android that allows you to take long exposures. Uh, I've got to imagine that, um, that iPhones can do that as well. And so, again, the, the, the beauty is take as long an exposure as you can get, and there are, I'll, I'll list a few softwares uh, later on here, but you can stack them later. And it's always best, I mean, if you can shoot raw, shoot raw, right? You, you, it's, it's never a good idea to shoot JPEG if you can avoid it. If you can't avoid it, it works on those two. Okay, great question. Thank you. Uh, so you've got to be able to focus or you're not going to be able to get a, a very good image at all. Uh, one of the best ways, and, and I, I, I used to shoot Canon all the time. Now I shoot Nikon um, because for quite a while, the sensors were just uh, better, right? They had a, just a, a much better range to them and, and better a lot of other things. 
Now they're pretty comparable again. But uh, you want to set the camera and lens to manual focus. Uh, one of the keys here is if you, uh, you open them up, okay, if you've got a lens that'll allow that, set the ISO up pretty high, and then set the camera to whatever your rig is for live view, right? So you can see a live image. And then zoom in all the way. If you can zoom in all the way, you focus on the brightest planet or star that you've got centered on the screen. You want to keep it toward the center of the lens because that will keep it the roundest. And you kind of rack it in and out of focus a little bit until you get to that sweet spot. Then you're going to want to stop, take a couple images, make sure that that is a really sharp star. And then once you've got that, you can say, you know what, I think I'm good to go to the next step. And uh, like in, in my case, I've got lenses that are going to open up to uh, F4, or I say 1.4. And so I set them back to 1.6 to 1.8, and I reset my ISO to 1600, because that will still gather plenty of light, it'll keep the noise down, and then I'll be able to get some really good and usable images. Now, I, I'll, I'll preface that, that's if I'm tracking. If I'm not tracking, you're gonna have your ISO set back up to around 6400, because the comet shots I showed you earlier, uh, those were all six seconds, uh, at like I, uh, F 1.6 and uh, ISO 60, or, uh, 6, uh, 6400. Because if you don't do that, you're probably not going to see the histogram that you need, and it's just not going to work out very well. Uh, this is with my, my older Canon gear, my 5D Mark II, uh, just single shot, uh, about 45 seconds, and uh, bristlecone pines. So you can get still really good images, even if you've got uh, gear that is a little bit uh, maybe dated at this point, uh, it still does a, a really good job. So when you're going to go out, what things do you want to consider? Well, you want to or you want to view your images uh, in the end on a good monitor at full size, because that's going to tell you whether or not your gear is actually performing the way you need it to. You also need to determine what your intended use is for the images. So if you want to just have them for your computer, well, you're going to have a lot more latitude in the way that you do things uh, as compared to if you want to blow them up to a really large size, which is one of the things that I like to do. Uh, what looks good on your camera is often not going to look good on your computer. So understanding your gear is really, really key. You've got to test that equipment and, and I mean, keep a list chart those conditions, and then look at it so that you know, oh, my camera and my lenses are good through this range. All right, testing everything before shooting uh, is, again, another huge key. If you're not doing that and comparing, then when you get out, you're going you're gonna to drive for uh, maybe hours to get to a nice dark sky. And when you shoot, you're going you're gonna to think, oh, I got it. It's really disappointing to not have that because I still do that today. And I've been doing this stuff kind of hardcore for about the last 16 years. Uh, learn new software. I was forced to quickly learn a couple new pieces of software so that I could understand what I'd need to set my gear to when that comet came up. Uh, but I, you know, I was on vacation at the time, but I didn't have to spend long. There are so many resources out on the internet right now. You can learn a lot very, very quickly so that you can get up to speed. This isn't something that needs to take you uh, weeks or months or years of learning like it did me when I started a long time ago. And uh, if you've got really good equipment, right, 90% of the results are gonna come from the good equipment, the other 90 are from processing. Maybe that doesn't quite add up to 100, but I think that's, that's my way of saying, you know, you, you've gotta get out there good. If you don't have good images to start with, the results aren't going to be good. But you can also have really good images to start with. And if you don't know how to process, it's not going to be good either. So uh, you can definitely spend uh, hours. I know in the early days when noise was a problem and other things were a problem, I would spend somewhere between two and 20 hours an image in post-processing. The nice part is with the software available today, you don't have to spend that much. Uh, usually a couple of hours and you can have something that you could put on your wall in the size of, say, a 20 by 30 or something if you're shooting with good gear. Okay, so again, get out, watch those online tutorials. They can really help you. Uh, this is a picture of the Andromeda Galaxy and the bristle cones. Just a, a few more. I, I like to show you uh, what's possible. You, you'll notice if you look really closely, depending on how your screen is, is displaying the images, there's a little bit of red up in here. 
because I got as much noise out as you can. When you're, when you're denoising an image, uh, it's a fine line between uh, wiping out a lot of the detail and getting rid of the noise. Again, the new software is much better. If I were to reprocess this image, it would look decently better than it does right now. Well, well I'll look at Go ahead. We've, got, we've got a question from Sarah. Uh, when you were discussing focusing tips um, on, you know, zooming into those stars in the live view, she asks, what, excuse me, would those focusing tips also apply to phone cameras? Uh, it, it, all phones are different and the software that you have with your phone is going to be different. So it, it, you've got to figure out if you can do anything to focus your phone. And I know that there are a couple of programs out there that will allow you to, to really tweak with a lot of settings. Uh, and it may even cost you a couple of bucks, but it'll be a couple of bucks well spent. The key there, based on your personal hardware, is to do the research to find out if there are apps that are compatible with your hardware. And uh, if, if you can, you know, again, find those brightest things. And the, the, the trouble with auto stuff, and phones are auto all the time, uh, is, is to make sure that you know, you, you, you find the, the bright object, and if you can get it focused and take it off the auto settings, you're going to do a lot better. You're going to have a lot more success. If it keeps auto focusing, you're going to be in trouble. All right. Uh, some, some, uh, some software in cameras are actually star eaters. They can just, they go, oh, this is noise, and they get rid of it. That used to be more of a problem, but if you're buying old gear, Beware of it, do your research. Uh, fast, high quality lenses are really good. Um, I've, 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 well, again, I'll show you some gear here in a little bit. I've got uh, F1.4 lenses. It makes an enormous difference. It's huge. Uh, 2.8 will do in most circumstances. 3.5 is really hard unless you're gonna start stacking. All right, uh, shutter release, you're gonna need one of those. Uh, I've, I forever have used a cable shutter release to trip the shutter on the camera. And uh, when I do that, you know, it, it, you're out, you're cabled to the camera, and I always track. So you got the tracking rig. You can always induce a little bit of shake to it. I'm pretty good and pretty steady, but I, I just this year finally invested in a wireless unit. And it's just night and day different in terms of being a stress reliever. Uh, I don't worry if I'm pulling on the camera anymore. I don't worry in the wind. Uh, it, it just works. So I highly recommend finding one of those that might work for your setup. Uh, back about 15 years ago, I bought this battleship of a tripod. The, just the tripod, no head is 13, or sorry, is 11 pounds. It's over 13 with the head. But because I, I couldn't stand the camera shake, I can tell you that if you've got a sturdy tripod and you're tracking, everything's going to quiet down, damp down, so that everything is steady again for the next shot. Twice as fast with a sturdy tripod as compared with a tripod that might be more fluttery. It might even be worse than that for you. But that's because my other my backup tripod is still pretty sturdy, but the big one is going to save me half. You know, it'll it'll save the, the time for half. Uh, your light source, you can go out, you can light landscapes as long as you're not in a park or somewhere else that prohibits lighting. Um, it's a very effective way to light a foreground and make your image more interesting so that you're just not dealing with silhouettes. Uh, and then uh, there are so many tracking platforms that are now available. You can get out and find many ways to track the stars. The hardest part is getting aligned to uh, Polaris. And the trouble is Polaris isn't directly over the North Pole, but it's close. So you've got to really be able to fine tune that, especially if you're going to track with a long lens and uh, try and do some more deep sky stuff. Uh, computer software for processing. Well, uh, it goes without saying there are so many uh, variants available. Do your research, figure out what's going to work for you and your system. Uh, I'll mention a few later, but here uh, it's it's it, it's just a, an amazing thing that there's so much available to us right now. Uh, this image shows I, I got my camera modified only about a year ago, and uh, the the red is uh, kind of more uh, of the kind of infrared that you'll get out of the night sky, and, and the summer shows that up a lot more. Uh, then this is called uh, Barnard's Loop around by Orion the Hunter here. So you've got two, two stars up for the shoulders, three belt stars. You can see there's, there's a lot going on. If you could zoom into that image, uh, a, a modified camera is going to be able to do a lot for you. And uh, locally, I mean, if you're, if you're tuning in from anywhere around Salt Lake City, 
I know that Spencer's camera does it. I'm sure there's lots of other great places that, that will do it too, but uh, they they do a great job. So that's that's something you should be aware of. Modifying a camera is, is actually kind of worth it if you can afford it. Uh, also in the twilight, you can see sometimes you can just do silhouettes and you don't really need anything special for that. Uh, uh, your, your regular lens, even if it's a 3.5, will allow you to take pictures like that. The star uh, right there is a star filter that I put on the lens at the time of image capture. And you can choose from a variety of star filters available. So I'm just going to go through these so you can start to, because the accessories, and, and if you want to screenshot these, I mean, please, you, you know, I, ho I hope you're doing it. Uh, there's just a, a lot of stuff. I'm trying to give you some of the tools to be able to get started in this field, because uh, honestly, we could go for, for several days uh, with all of the things that, that we could do. But uh, there's a lot of uh, fun things that you can purchase that will make your life a lot easier. Uh, for, for that said, a good intervalometer is one of them. An intervalometer will allow you to take uh, exposures of a set length for a set time, whatever that is, and do it repeatably. And that's what you're going to need, especially if you're going to stack them or if you're going to uh, stitch them together edge to edge. All right. General, just a couple of broad categories for types of photos. Classic star trails, track photos in which the stars don't move, the classic star trails, the stars do move. And then, of course, panoramas, where you just take one image and put them uh, next to the other. Star trails, well, that's one of the first ones I ever took over Delicate Arch. It's going to check things out. And that's the way it looks when you're kind of looking to the southeast, where Delicate Arch is from that particular vantage point. Uh, different uh, arches, a double arch up in arches. You can see that right down in the little crook here is the North Star. The Little Dipper is right here. And these are the stars in the handle of the Big Dipper. So at the, just exactly the right time of night, at the right time of year, you can go out and get that shot if you want to. Uh, this is actually about a 20 minute image, uh, again, with the old gear. And we'll talk more about taking Star Trail pictures. You don't need to take them for 20 minutes anymore. Uh, that image actually had an enormous amount of noise in it. And now there's better techniques. You don't need to do that. All right. Uh, one of the benefits of taking star trail pictures is you don't have to fix the stars. Uh, on the edge of the field, they're going to, you're going to get elongations. I'll show you what that looks like later. But uh, that's not something you have to deal with. And the ISOs you're dealing with are moderately low in that range. And, uh, you know, F3.5 is just fine for star trail pictures. So this is a really good way to get into this uh, as a trial or as, as a hobby. I used to take them at 10 to 25 minutes. Now, uh, the recommendation is 30 seconds to two minutes because that keeps the noise down. And uh, you just you can take so much longer uh, uh, sequences that you can stack together any, any amount of the sequences you want to really, really well. Uh, and there are plugins available for Photoshop, or you can get a program called Star Stacks that will do it for you quite easily. Doesn't take much at all. But uh, again, the, those shorter exposures are really the way to go. Okay, and then the lens size and aperture matters, but star trails, you can get uh, just those kit lenses to work very, very well. All right, uh, so we've got the North Star. Well, uh, Generally, if you're going to track, you need to have good polar alignment. How in the world do you do that? Uh, this bright star here, it's about the 50th brightest star in the night sky, almost. Uh, you wind up in the handle of the Little Dipper. The way you find it is going to the Big Dipper, wherever that happens to be on your night. And there are apps that will help you find that, as uh, again, the previous program probably showed. You make a line out of the two pointer stars and you travel to Polaris. However, uh, True North is actually a little bit toward the bright star down here from Polaris. So you don't aim directly at it if you're going to be tracking. It is really, really a key to getting good images to make sure you can find that very exactly. Again, if you're not tracking, hey, you can see where the pole star is on that image quite easily. You know, it's just right up here, right? It's the one that is not appearing to move very much at all over the course of the night.
Okay, we're just gonna show you a few similar images. Uh, in this case, the light was provided by a two million candle power spotlight that I tend to carry with me. So you can give it a quick light for several seconds and that's just plenty. But it does help to, to really show off the foreground better. Uh, this is ambient lighting. And of course, if you've ever been to uh, Zion National Park, you may recognize this. This is Jenny Lake in the Tetons, and uh, it was one of the very rare nights when it was pretty calm in the lake. Usually a good wind's blowing through there, but these are the bright stars in the handle of the Big Dipper, which is right here. So knowing where the Big Dipper is and a few other constellations is really also helpful if you want to uh, enhance your compositions. So I promised some software uh, programs. So uh, DxO, uh, they've won actually a bunch of awards. And uh, right now, PhotoLab 4, and they've got something in there called, uh, uh, it's, oh gosh, and I forgot what it is. Uh, it was the deep noise reduction. Uh, and boy, that just does an amazing job because it compares every pixel uh, in there to the thousand nearest pixels to figure out what's noise and what's not noise. And uh, it's stuff I used to actually spend hours doing in probably a process of about three other three or four other pieces of software. Uh, Photoshop does an enormous amount of good things. Uh, Lightroom is also good. I use that sparingly, but I'm starting to learn that a little bit more now. Uh, Noise Ninja is what I used to use for noise reduction, and it's still a good program. If you happen to have bought that before, it's it's great. Uh, there's one called Starry Night or Starry Starry Sky Stacker uh, for Mac, and that's a good one. Or Sequitur for PC. And those will do your stacking. And even if you've got uh, you know multiple images where the sky is moving but the foreground is not, those will allow you to, uh, I mean, to, to just put them into the program and auto uh, adjust the sky, put all your images together, and then keep your foreground pretty static. So uh, those do amazing things afterwards. Uh, images Plus, I had for, I was a long time ago. If you're really going to get into something like uh, deep sky photography through a telescope, that's more something that you're going to want to get into because that thing uh, has is an RL sharpening. It's called Richards and Lucy sharpening. It's a non-destructive way to sharpen things. It's very processor intensive, but also very, very good. And then this other one that I mentioned before, which is called Star Stacks, if you're going to do uh, some stars where you're aiming at Polaris and wanting to get some star trails. So these are either uh, free or very, very low cost uh, ways to get into doing all this. And the tutorials, again, allow you to do it very quickly. Uh, just as a, as a really quick show here, uh, this is a DxO Deep Prime Noise Reduction. And you can see this is just the original image is the big one. And uh, I've gotten all the color out of it. This is a real, real tight zoom in of the Andromeda galaxy. That's why everything's kind of big and fuzzy. But I wanted to really show off the noise. Look at this image, the inset. It got rid of all of that noise. So it is just an incredible way to really clean up the images that you may have. Okay, well, have we got any more questions or are we still good? We do. Mark asks, have you used Deep Sky Stacker? I have, actually. I um, Usually every year I put out a calendar. And uh, this last year, I, I actually had the, my tracker going with a 600 millimeter lens on it. And I took a whole series of, of shots just with that. And so help me at F, uh, I think it was 6.5. And I put them together and it, it does an amazing job. So yes, absolutely, it's a, it's a great program to use. Thank you for, for sharing that one, yes. All right, uh, track photos are more difficult and there's more noise because you've got longer exposures and uh, you've got to have a really good polar alignment. And sometimes you have to round the stars in the corner of the frame because uh, when you're really, really wide open, the stars on the edge will flare and you can go back in, uh, in you know, whatever third party software you use for that. I tend to use Photoshop, but whatever you, you're using, you can actually kind of round the stars out. Uh, but, you know, if you're tracking, you're probably up around uh, 1600 to 2500 for 30 to 40 seconds. Uh, and that's with the lens pretty, pretty far open. So um, I'll just let you, you glance at that for a moment. Um, you know, panoramas. 
uh, I, I've gotten to the point where I kind of almost just shoot a full sky sky cap. I shoot all around the, the base once, and then I'll shoot around the top. And that allows you a lot of flexibility when you're putting stuff together uh, later. But, you know, if you've got a nice something nice in your foreground, obviously, you may only need to take a couple of photos. So that's all good, too. Uh, you've got to have some processing. The files are going to be really, really big if you're, if you're putting a bunch of them together. Uh, this is the uh, telescopes in Hawaii. Uh, you've got Alpha and Beta Centauri down here. So, you know, you can take gear with you wherever you go if you're going to go up on a mountaintop. I went to Hawaii. I was one of the weirdos that took an extra suitcase. And in it, I had a snowsuit and a parka and a couple other things in Hawaii. And it saved my bacon because it was like 20 degrees up there that night. So you don't want to be out. You don't want to, you know, get cold and, and be miserable. All right. Another thing you can do is use the moon. If you've got light from a, uh, a, a quarter moon or less, it can really add interest. If you really want to light up the landscape, then, you know, maybe you're out more in a full moon, but it's just going to be a different quality of light and you're not going to show off the stars very well. So I tend to like somewhere between crescent and a first quarter or crescent and last quarter moon. If I'm going to do it. Uh, and the, again, the brighter it is, the more it washes out the sky and those stars you're trying to show off. Uh, for this one, you can tell the foreground's all lit up because the moon was out. The inside of this is false Kiva in Canyonlands. And uh, so what I had to do for this is I had to get a, two separate shots uh, with the camera in the same location. And then these are, these are pans. These are about five or six shot pans left to right. And uh, we had the moonlight outside lighting up everything really well. And then, of course, I have the Milky Way. So I had to take that when the moon wasn't in the sky. So you've, you've kind of got to time it exactly right so that you're there. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, otherwise the moon is going to completely blow that out. But uh, if, you can, if you can do that, then it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, this isn't moonlight. Uh, it, moonlight would do a very similar effect. That's why I put it in there. And that I actually lit uh, Turret Arch with my big spotlight. And then the other one is not lit. So you can see it's kind of about the same time of night. Again, lit with a spotlight. This is when it was legal to do all of that in the parks. And it is no longer in most in many, many parks. All right, settings I use for tracked images. And the little things really, really do matter. Uh, having a good lens. There's your ISOs. <clears throat> Exposure lengths. If you're doing this, uh, if you've got a quality D lizard for DSLRs, you're going to be able to uh, get something that's very usable. Uh, I used to always shoot everything with the dark frame enabled in there. It, it will subtract the noise away from each image. Uh, the way things are nowadays with the, between the software and the in-camera processing, it's often better not to do that because it, it keeps your sensor will take another frame, which heats up your sensor more, which adds to the noise, which causes more problems. So uh, again, the key is know your gear, do some tests, find out what's best for you. Uh, okay, live viewer, live focus. Uh, if you've been out shooting, say for 20 to 30 minutes, that's why I always like to get where I'm going uh, between an hour and an hour and a half ahead of time. Make sure the gear is out and cool down am in ambient temperatures. You, you get it all tweaked in, wait 30 minutes, and then do it again. Because as everything cools down or warms up, hopefully cools down since you're out at night, um, you know, you're going to see the focus actually shift in that. And it really does make a difference if you tweak it in right before, you know, whatever your prime time is on those objects that you're going to try and, and shoot for. Uh, this uh, image right here was a panorama uh, down in Monument Valley, and it was a setting uh, third quarter moon. I think the probably within the next 10 to 15 minutes, the moon set, uh, right as I got that image. So it does wash out the sky a bit, but it really lights up the foreground nicely. Okay, no, no lighting there really, but you can also tell the, the, the big bulge of the center of our galaxy, our galactic core, is up much, much higher in that image. Right? So it depends on where you are on the Earth as to what you're going to get. Um, okay, a couple of quick things here for uh, settings. So you can see this image is it's kind of this is raw out of the camera, and it's kind of washed out, and it's you can't really tell because of the size of it, but it, it's actually really noisy. And so when you're processing, this is my plug for learning how to process. If you don't already know, you can make it a whole lot better 
by getting the color balance right, getting the noise out, and uh, getting the contrast right. Those are kind of the, the three big keys to making decent images when you're doing that sort of stuff. If you zoom in on it, now you can see the noise a whole lot more. Uh, at least uh, it, it's showing up pretty well on, on my monitors. Hopefully you can see it. There's this red red stuff in the sky everywhere. This is, again, the old uh, Canon 5D Mark II. And uh, you know if, if you process, this is just a little bit different part of the same image. Uh, you can get rid of all of that stuff. My original camera that I really got into this horrible, horrible uh, habit and hobby with was the Canon 5D. And it was really, 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 really noisy. And so that's what the original looks like. And again, it, I, I bet I spent five or six hours just processing just to try to get the noise out of it because I, I printed that one big too uh, back in the day. I mentioned rounding stars. This is what the stars can look like in the corners of your lenses when you have your lenses wide open. It's, it's not pretty, but you can fix it. All right, tell you what, before we start panoramas, I wanna get in and uh, show you a couple of things. So I am gonna stop showing you that screen and show you a little bit of the gear that I happen to have. So there are uh, many different brands of all these things. This isn't an endorsement for, for any of them in particular, but this is just what I use. So uh, this is the uh, sky, and hopefully it'll show up. The Skywatcher. Oh, and it's, it's let's, let's get, oh, it's fading out. Okay, well, it's called the, the, the Skywatcher. And uh, it is a, a bulletproof, I mean, this thing is a, a wonderful tracker. Uh, the cost online is about uh, $400, and uh, it will just track wonderfully. It's, it's just like a battleship. Uh, there's another one that's kind of its competitor that I'm aware of, at least, called Ioptron. And they're very, very, very similar as far as I can tell. I also mentioned having a uh, wireless device that you can put on your camera. So you, you want uh, what we used to call the cable release. Now we call the intervalometer. Uh, again, I highly recommend wireless on those now that I've tried that. Uh, there is a high-end one uh, that's just kind of come out recently because uh, I'm, I'm about I'm going to start shooting some, some time-lapse photography like a, a few other folks have been. But uh, this is uh, a nice little timer that I've got. It's, it's, they're blurring it out. Okay, this is from LR Time Lapse, and it's uh, kind of the, the, the Pro Timer 3. And it's really uh, going to allow me to do more things that kind of at the next level when I'm going to take a series of images and kind of make time lapse out of them. Uh, also, oh, by the way, I, I set this stuff over too far. Uh, if you're tracking, um, you can get kind of a, the, the mount that has the counterweight in it and uh, the, 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 the ball head, so you put these together, and this winds up to be a really uh, powerful way to use a, a big lens on your camera so that you can really zoom in and, and get some uh, images of, of just kind of more singular images, like galaxies, like, like when I took the uh, uh, image of, of um, uh, a couple of galaxies this summer, it just made a really, really big difference. Okay, the other thing here, so uh, one, one thing about lenses, so just because you're buying a brand name lens doesn't mean you're getting a good one. Uh, there is an art to putting lenses together. And what I've discovered is you really need to go uh, and test them. You get them and you test them. If you can get a company that you like that will let you test them, that's what you want to do. Uh, the box, this is my Rokinon lens. Uh, I've got a set of these because you can buy them for between four and $500 a lens which may sound like a lot, but if you're buying Canon or Nikon lenses, you're up uh, maybe around uh, $1,800 to $2,500. Uh, you can also buy Zeiss, which is nice, and they're about $2,500. But the software allows you to make up for a lot of the imperfections in what these maybe these, these uh, cheaper lenses will do. And uh, I've got to tell you, what, what I wound up doing is I order four or five or six at a time I, I go out and I test them at night and I send back all but the best one because the, the, there is really an art. Some of them will just be garbage for doing night sky photography. And some of them will just present you with beautiful, beautiful stars all the way out to the corners. That's one of the things to look for. We have any more questions at this point? We do. Yeah. Ryan wants to know, how are you getting star spikes? I think you mentioned an app that you use to add those. Oh, um, so there is, there are plugins available for Photoshop. Uh, there are, I think, other tutorials online about how to do it. I've never wanted to do it in post, 
what I do is I add, I actually do it at image capture and I put a filter. I put a daytime star filter like you would if you were using a starburst for the sun on the camera at night. And what it does is only the brightest stars will flare. Okay, so your, your, your dim stars, you won't even notice it, but it really helps you to pull out the constellations and uh, be able to kind of make sense of the night sky. So it's just not this giant mess of stars. But I do that at image capture because it's easy. It's there they are. Wonderful. And Justina asks if you can explain what noise is for those who might not know. Oh, thank you. Good point. So when you're shooting, um, a lot of people that just deal with cell phones are, don't, don't notice it. Uh, but when you blow things up to, you know, 100% or thereabouts on your on your screen, if you're going to do image processing, you'll notice all of these green and red pixels because of the way that uh, sensors work and that images are captured. And the more green and red, and th that, that's, that's the chromatic noise, the color noise, uh, there's also noise in there that you'll see that just de kind of degrades the image in general. Uh, so it, it, it's having an image that isn't like an image that you take with lots of light uh, because the sensor is having to uh, kind of basically work a lot harder. And so it induces a lot of these artifacts that you need to get rid of in post-processing when you have longer exposures, or if you, in some cases, have your, your lens wide open and high ISOs. Hope that helps. Any more? Yes, Michael asks, will astrophotography with telescopes and use of Pixinsight come up as well? I, I'm not familiar with that one. Uh, I, I've done very limited work uh, in telescopes. Most of my astrophotography is place-based stuff, but I can tell you there are, there's, you know, tutorial and, and review after review and tutorial online uh, about how to do this, this deep sky image processing. There's, there's some really great stuff. I've watched a couple of them recently. I just haven't done it a lot. Are there any more? Not so far. I'll keep an eye on it. Awesome. Okay. Uh, let's just talk. Oh, we're going to blow through panoramas real quick here and, and talk about those as I get to share this again. So if you're going to look at panoramas, you need to plan ahead, know what, you know, left to right you're shooting, how, how high up, where your uh, stars are going to be in the image. So uh, usually it's really good to take a couple of test runs before it's prime time to make sure you got things right and step through them and say, it, it does work out the way I think it's going to work out. Uh, popular printing is a one to two or one to three aspect ratio. In other words, if you're going to print large, let's say a one foot by two foot picture or a, a one foot by three foot picture or, or more. Uh, right now I'm doing 30 by 60 inch uh, uh, panoramas and I, I just, I'm in love with that size and that because they, they show off all the stuff really, really well. Again, I mentioned the star filter there. Again, thanks for the, the, the good question about that. Uh, easy to see constellations. And, uh, you know, usually you get a time for a couple of passes uh, when the stars happen to be in the right place. And boy, wind can just blow your stuff all over the place. Uh, I mentioned, I haven't mentioned this one yet, but I do use PT GUI, which is based on panorama tools for stitching my, my uh, images together. Uh, if you're using Photoshop or something else, sometimes those work better. Basically, it's nice to have a couple of options because if, if one software doesn't handle stitching your images together, another software might. And uh, again, you've kind of got to just try those out and, and learn what's, what's going to work. Uh, down in Zion National Park, uh, again, this is just ambient light from the town. There was no moon or anything else in there, but that's where that all comes from. So, you know, you, you just have to know when to be there. And that's that's one of the keys. And uh, again, you mentioned Stellarium and things earlier. So using a lot of the software that's available uh, to show you when things will be in the sky is really going to help you be able to plan your trips a lot better. So the bristle cone pines again. Yep. All right, so recommendations that I have, uh, you, you definitely want to get out and test, 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 practice, test, practice. Yeah, all those things. Uh, you want to keep good records. It's important to write this stuff down as you're testing. That's what's going to make you a much better astrophotographer and help you figure out what way you're going to go. I used to keep pages and pages of records. I used to have a two-page workflow to I mean, just, just step through this, 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 this. 
to try to process all the noise out. Luckily, again, the software has advanced so much you don't need to do that anymore. But uh, you notice that testing keeps cropping up. If you don't know your gear and how it's going to react, you're not going to figure out how to get the most out of your images. Um, when you're out there on location, of course, you want to go shoot daylight stuff as well. And if you're out at night, remember uh, the golden hour, kind of an hour or you know sunrise to that first hour or uh, that last hour of the day. Very nice to be out. You know, plan your shots before that you know, during the middle of the day. And then you can be out and get those other good shots. <coughs> and um, the other thing that, that's always been something that I've done is you, you go out and you take some good shots. Uh, you know, you, you might not even think they're going to be good at the time, but you may be surprised later when you come back. Uh, I've got questions uh, and, and whatnot here. So any of that is uh, certainly fair game. And you can email me uh, at that uh, email address below. And uh, I do work at the Clark Planetarium, and uh, we enjoy do, doing things there and helping people to get out and enjoy the night sky. So, you know, it's, it's just something that uh, has been a passion of mine uh, for, for quite a few years. And right now, uh, I, I think it's just time for a lot of you to get out and look at what equipment you have and try and do something fun with it. Uh, I'm going to stop presenting here for just a second. There's a couple more pieces of uh, equipment I want to show you, and then uh, we can spend the last couple of minutes on questions. Uh, there's another one. It's very the, the, the one that I the tracker I showed you was uh, the the Sky Watcher, and there's another one called that I've I've, I've purchased called Move Shoot Move. And this is uh, I, I, the previous model broke. This is this is the the kind of the upgraded model, but uh, it also acts as a a time lapse rotator, and it's just this little thing. It's like uh, the size of a pack and a half of cigarettes, and it's light, and you put a ball head on it, and this does a, a really great job tracking. I'm sure there's others available as well. And uh, if I'm shooting panoramas, especially at night or during the day, it's great too. I use this little indexing head. It can be had uh, for anywhere from like 40 to 100 bucks, depending on what kind you want, but that allows you to pan and take uh, – uh, images in just the right amounts of sky and you don't have to I used to have to just eyeball it and this takes a lot of the guesswork out if you're going to shoot images of a uh, or with your uh, zoom lens uh, I, I had I made this little thing is this fits over my zoom lens and uh, this is called a batten off mask and it's they use them on telescopes but this allows you to focus very precisely when you've got uh, a long lens. And so I shoot that when I'm shooting like 600 millimeters. So I'll start, to, I'll stop talking there. And uh, if we've got any more questions. We do, we do. Yes, Mark asks a big question. What full frame cameras are good these days for astro imaging? Is the Sony A7 III good or Canon or dynamic, oh, excuse me, is dynamic range that critical when choosing a camera? 12 stops, 14 stops? Dynamic range is absolutely huge. And uh, that's that's why I, in the, that's why I transitioned from, from Canon gear to Nikon gear. Now they're all very comparable. Uh, I, yes, the, the Sony uh, A7R uh, three, four, yeah, two, three, four, uh, they're, they can be phenomenal. They, they eat batteries like mad, so you may have to get the battery adapter, but they're, they're phenomenal. Um, I, I'm shooting a Nikon. My modified camera, because I had an old one, was a, a Nikon D800E. You want to get make sure they don't have that uh, uh, extra filter in there. And because it makes much sharper images, uh, but Canon is is right there with them as well. So uh, there was a couple of tests that you can look up tests on websites, and they're all quite comparable. Uh, the last couple of reviews I saw showed Nikon stuff was just ever so slightly ahead of some of the others for certain astro applications. Uh, also note that certain cameras can't be modified. If you want to take out uh, the you know the the, the one filter. You, you've, you've got to get out like your IR filter and put a different one in. Uh, there are the Sony's, you, you can't do that with the most latest uh, in the Sony's because they have a, uh, a little LED or something inside that will fog your images. So you've got to do that research ahead too. But they're all pretty comparable now, getting up about 14.8 to 15 stops of, of, of dynamic range. 
Great. Patrick asks, what about cropped sensors like Fuji? Um, generally, in, in crop sensor cameras, your in your field of view isn't isn't as big, so you would want to probably look to maybe stitch images together, which is one option. And crop sensor cameras will you because the the pixel then the pixels are smaller and there's higher density, uh, they'll usually be higher noise. So you'll have to really investigate some noise reduction techniques and uh, stacking can certainly help alleviate a lot of those. A lot of people that are shooting through telescopes use the crop sensor cameras because you do get more magnification. And then you're shooting so many images, you do get rid of a lot of the noise that way. For single images, I think full frame cameras are mostly preferred. Wonderful. You mentioned stacking in that last answer, which is perfect because Karen wants to know, can you explain what stacking is and what is it used for? Awesome. Uh, so if you're going to take, uh, let's say I want to, uh, I've got a, a cool foreground image, and, but I want the stars to show up really beautifully behind it. But whatever my gear is, uh, again, even like my, and I've got pretty decent gear, uh, I, I couldn't track the sky. So I had to take a picture. I wanted the comet to show up really, really well. So I took, uh, I took six images of the comet in each location, and then I'd move it. And, and uh, But those six images of the comet, got stacked and composited together in the software. And by the way, this is like a free software. And depending on the settings you choose, you can have all the light that is collected from each of the images add to itself, or it can, you, can, you can do kind of a hybrid where the dimmer light will all add up, but it'll prevent it from blowing out the stars or blowing out other places in there. So you get a beautiful dark sky with brighter images than you'd otherwise get. So basically you're utilizing all that extra light that you're collecting in the images. So it's like taking one much longer exposure. And at the same time it's stacking, it gets rid of some of the noise, which is also very, very helpful. I didn't mention much about taking some dark frames after. Uh, if you're getting more advanced with it, you'll probably want to take some dark, dark frames on a night for a shoot too, which will help in post-processing. Wonderful. That is all of the questions that I have in comments. Um, I will put your email address, your contact information in the comments um, so that folks know how to reach you um, if they do have questions afterwards. And for anyone who came in late or wants access to some of those uh, links to resources that Duke mentioned, uh, this video will be on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. Uh, for all of eternity, so you can reference it whenever you'd like. Uh, we've got uh, another comment or question. Patrick wants to know what is a dark frame. Ah, uh, so uh, you can take, you can enable your com your uh, camera to take a dark frame, which basically uh, it doesn't let any light into the sensor, but it just turns the sensor on for whatever time your sensor was on before. And it, it, it takes and it gets an image of the noise that's generated largely because of the heat from the sensor. And then it takes those two images together and it subtracts the noise from the original image and it gets rid of some of the noise. Again, depending on your processing workflow, that can be helpful and it can be detrimental depending on what you're working with. Uh, the way that I mentioned it is, let's say I, I took uh, six or eight images of the comet. When I was done, I'd want to take another eight to 16 images with the lens cap on at exactly the same settings, temperature and everything like right after, because that will enable me to, to, to take those images into this software, again, much of it free. And the software will take, it'll average those frames together. It'll say, oh, there's all my noise. And it'll subtract it from my comet picture and it'll make those images much less noisy. So uh, definitely worth something looking into. And you know, it's kind of a pain. And to be honest, I don't even do that very often. I, I, I mainly rely on the software because it is so good now, you don't have to do it near as much as you used to. Oh, wonderful. We've got another question. Mark asks, how, excuse me, have you used light pollution filters? Uh, so when I got the D800E modified, and uh, I, I shot with it for the fir first six months or so, and then I actually invested in one of the high-end light pollution filters. You can put screw-on ones in there. There are also ones that you can add in right in front of the sensor, and those are more expensive, 
But when you look at the reviews online and what they do for you, because they, they, they really filter out specific bands, uh, often of you know what a lot of the streetlights will put out, and those can actually really make a difference. So yes, so the, right now, and I have just in the last, like I say, in the last year, I've started really using a light pollution filter, and I think it helps. It, 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 overall, it helps more with the contrast of the sky than anything else. Wonderful. Uh, I, I do have one comment um, from Katie that I wanted to point out. Katie um, wants to be in Utah, but she's in Ohio um, and she's grateful for the presentation. But I just wanted to say to Katie and anyone else who doesn't get to enjoy our amazing dark skies in Utah, um, check out darksky.org and find a dark sky place near you. Um, of course, Utah's leading the globe in dark sky places. <laughs> um, but I bet if you hop onto that website um, and do a quick search, you can find um, somewhere with some amazing night skies um, from wherever you are. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I used to live in North Carolina for about 10 years, and we'd go to the Blue Ridge Parkway to, to, to shoot. So I, I know it's challenging on the East Coast, but it, that's absolutely your best bet go find that light pollution map and you can find at least the darkest skies near you or take a trip out this way and uh, you know you'll see some phenomenal stuff yes indeed okay the comments section has quieted down if you're if you're watching this late after the live presentation throw your comments in that's one of my favorite things to do is is answer questions and reply to those so it's not too late uh, I'm going to say thank you so much to Duke uh, for, for doing this presentation. Uh, knowledge way beyond my scope. So I'm, I'm so grateful for, for you being willing to share that with us. And he's, he's the man behind the curtain again, Ryan Andreasen with Night Sky Science is in the background um, working his magic because that is beyond my scope again. So, so much thanks um, to Ryan and his help and in, in making all of this tech stuff work for us. And I will put his information in the comments also because he's doing some really phenomenal stuff. Um, so you'll want to check that out and keep looking up.